Welcome to another CEO Wisdom Podcast with Garland Vance. He is CEO and founder at Advanced Leadership. He's also the author of Getting Unbusy, um, which is a cool book that I'm adding to my reading list, Five Steps to Kill Busyness and Live with Purpose, Productivity, and Peace. Love it. Garland, can you briefly introduce yourself and tell us about your businesses? Sure, absolutely. So uh, Dr. Garland Vance, I, I actually have a doctorate in leadership. I spent 15 years with this little chicken restaurant called Chick-fil-A in uh, nonprofit leadership development for them. And uh, then in 2017, my wife and I started our business, Advanced Leadership. We began to realize that uh, a lot of the leaders who we were talking to uh, just needed help. We were concentrating primarily on Sunday morning type of leadership development, and they needed Monday through Friday leadership development. And so we uh, started our business and we concentrate on organizations that have a thousand or more employees who know that they need to develop their leaders, but don't know how to do it. And so we come in and we help them develop those leaders. Right. And I have read on your LinkedIn that, you know, people don't quit jobs, they quit bad leadership. Um, so tell me about your full stories, your, your full story and how you came about in writing that book and sort of fighting for people to be in a more positive uh, workplace environment. Sure. So, uh, so my leadership journey actually started in the ninth grade when uh, I was uh, part of a uh, an organization as a as a volunteer, and I saw a new leader come in. And within about a year of that new leader coming in, the whole organization had fallen apart, and people lost their jobs, and people were quitting. Um, and uh, it fascinated me. It fascinated me that one person could do that much damage in such a short amount of time, uh, and that's what got me interested in leadership. And then uh, when I was working on my doctoral work, I became uh, interested in busyness. Uh, you know, everybody we know talks about how busy they are. And I became interested in busyness when uh, I went to the doctor. I was having all these physical problems like chronic migraine headaches and fatigue, uh, memory loss. And I went to the doctor saying, what's wrong with me? Do I have a brain tumor? You know, do I have a heart problem? And the doctor uh, listened to my story about 50 to 60 hour work weeks and traveling for my doctoral studies and having three young kids and helping out in the community. And the doctor said, Garland, I'm concerned for your life. And the reason I am is because you're so busy and your busyness is killing you. And so I became interested in busyness in leaders and what it does to them and what it does to organizations. Okay. And hmm, it seems to me that it's stress also because yeah there's two types of busy uh there's probably more but you know there's unproductive busyness uh, i would say that 80 percent of humans fall into that aka bullshit jobs you know people that just uh input something into either something that doesn't yield anything or an outcome that is just totally useless for the world um but let's not get too deep into that one that's that one's for another day but I feel that, yeah, in your case, it's just like overworking, not enough sleep and so forth. But were you making an impact and were you happy with the outcome of your work and your business? Yeah, I think that was one of the crazy parts of it is I loved my life. I thought I had a great life. You know, I had some physical problems, but I, I loved the work I was doing. I loved the studying that I was doing. I loved my I still love my family. Um, I, there wasn't anything that I was doing that I didn't love. And that's actually the cause, you know, you talk about this second type of busyness where you're actually making an impact on the world. That's the type of busyness that I became really interested in is people who are type A personalities, who are go-getters, who, who want to make an impact in the world. And yet they're still so busy doing good things that their impact is diminished, their productivity is diminished. And so, so I ended up defining busyness as an overcommitment to too many good commitments. Uh, and, and it's kind of like uh, the, the illustration I give in the book is having a, I had a middle school son at the time who went to eat, uh, at, uh, went to eat sushi 
he ate this huge amount of sushi and sushi is good. It's a great food, but he ate so much sushi that for the next three years, if anybody said the word sushi, he would start gagging. It was too much of a good thing. That's the type of dizziness we want to kill. Right. Okay. Let's, um, well, to, to me, it seems that, yeah, it's about decision making skills and, and planning for the one domino that may make all the others fall, you know, because in life, <clears throat> I think the best of humans, they A-B test quite a lot. So they're in various directions. Um, level two humans will definitely stay stuck at the testing phase and will never get out of it. They will have really the mindset. They'll just like test out everything. Level try, I think it's about analyzing about the impact of your actions and where you invest your time, coming back to the drawing board and going at it again. You know, like a lot of people were against uh, Steve Jobs from always changing ideas or Elon Musk, you know, they criticize him for the bad decisions, but at least he takes the shots, you know, and he evaluates the outcome of them and he gets better and better at making decisions. So did you have that algorithm in your life to just A-B test where you would invest your energy and measure what one domino may make a hundred dominoes fall over? Yeah, well, I think I had to learn that. So, I mean, it was it was crazy because at the time I had, I, I was a time management junkie. I had read hundreds of books, literally hundreds of books on, on time management. I was teaching time management to people, but the... The, the mistake that I was making was that I, again, I was involved in too many good obligations. And so I did have to take a step back. I, I, essentially, I went through, through five stages or five steps for it. The first step was I had to decide that busyness wasn't worth the cost physically, mentally, emotionally, relationally. Um, then I had to begin looking at my life and I deconstructed right? What is going on that, uh, what am I committed to that I don't need to be committed to? And, and more importantly, were what are the things that I'm believing that are not true? For example, I believed that my significance was wrapped up in my activity level rather than just being significant as a human being. And I, I believed that activity equaled accomplishment. And those are two very different things. There's There's activity of just spinning your wheels all day long. There's accomplishment of actually moving the ball forward. So those were two big things that I had to go through. And then I began to design, okay, what are the primary areas where I add value to the world? How do I do more and more of those and less and less of, of everything else? Right. Hmm. Once you become in control of your life, you make a good decisions and so forth and you have yourself a, a decent business um comes in growth if and growth is synonym with managing a team of humans uh me i've managed over a thousand of humans and i've came to the conclusion that i'm better off managing bots i've tried the empathy game i've tried um yeah i, I really uh, tried probably like I scaled the experiment to 95% of its capacity and came back with a clear conclusion, which was that I'm not made to manage uh, low performers. Um, meaning that nowadays I invest quite a lot in partnerships, uh, uh, partnering up with other businesses, hiring consultants that are quite smart, co-founding businesses, but hire, hiring salaried people. I think the premise is fundamentally wrong anyone that will accept a salary is cruising, you know, they're on cruise control and they want security and stability. And that means that we won't have the same value, them and I, I'm a hunter and I understand that I need to work or that I'm going to get paid in direct proportion to the meat that I bring back to the fire. And God knows that I bring a lot of that meat, you know, I'm a great hunter. Um, while most humans will expect to be paid uh, without necessarily bringing any results. Uh, hence it I'm yeah I described like team human that the the investments that I'm making in team humans partners co-founders consultants but I'm also directly outsourcing to AIs and automation nowadays I'm no yeah. longer trying to scale uh, a team of humans so what do you have to say on these philosophies because I, I tend to look at things from contrarian lens which is that 
why should I even fix my leadership and trying to swim counter current? I think I'm a great human. I'm I'm very much on the rational side rather than the EQ side, although I, I can show some love also. I think we're all about love in, in the end, but I don't think that empathy scales with capitalism or its strictest form. So I'm like, why, why bother about leadership recruitment when there's another path that's completely different and in my opinion, way more profitable. So any thoughts on, on these thoughts? Sure. So I, I would say, you know, for, for, for somebody who uh, adopts your philosophy, that's, that's great, right? You know yourself well enough to know you don't want to manage people a lot. You don't want to manage low performers. You don't want to partner with people who are, are salaried. And that's great. Um, I think there's a, a pretty large portion of the world though, who is comfortable with a salary and they don't want to be the hunter gatherer uh, person and and the the problem that comes with with them right if they're if they're listening the problem that they experience is in a salaried position you have to understand that work expands to fill the time allotted and right that's that's parkinson's law and in a salaried position the work will never be finished and the and as a result, the hours will never be finished. And so for somebody like you who's scaling with AI and you're scaling with partnerships, you can have you and I can have more control over the type of work that we do for the average salaried person or for the above average salaried person. They have to define what the boundaries are. They have to shrink the amount of time that they give to their job so that they can actually become more productive. Right. And once you decide to play the human game, what is a uh, toxic leader compared to a good leader? For example, what would be your thoughts on Elon Musk or Steve Jobs? Yeah, so I'm I'm actually currently reading Elon Musk's uh, biography, and uh, I, and I wouldn't say that I would would have uh, I, I have not yet formed opinions on that. Let me tell you what Elon Musk does really well. I don't know what he doesn't do well yet, but I, I'll tell you uh, what empathy. Toxic he doesn't leaders, do well. Yeah, he doesn't do empathy. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what he does do really well is leaders have to have a vision of the future, right? If you don't see very clearly where you're going in the future and how you can get others there, you can't lead other people. You might be able to, you, you know, you might be able to be a friend to them. You might be able to, to, you know, be their boss, but you can't actually lead unless you have a clear vision of what the future is. He is very clear on that. And I think Elon Musk is also very clear on the few ways that he wants to impact the world, right? He wants to uh, you know, get people moving to Mars so that we have secondary planets to live on. He wants to make sure that the energy crisis is dealt with in some ways through uh, through electric cars. So I think he's pretty clear on his his vision of the future. What I will say about toxic leaders in general, not Elon Musk. Again, I, I'm not, not not there yet in in my understanding of him. But I would say most toxic leaders either overvalue results or overvalue relationships without seeing that leadership is both. It has to be both results and relationships. Now, relationships doesn't mean you have to be best friends with everybody, but you do have to have enough trust built with the people that they'll listen to your opinions, that they'll trust you when you make hard decisions. Um, so that's what most toxic leaders get wrong is they either over overemphasize results and they push people too hard or they overemphasize relationships and they're nice to everybody and ev everybody's best friend, but they don't actually get the results that they need. Right. Everything is like grace. It's never black or white, but in Elon's case and Job's case, it's definitely probably 90% results oriented and very, very few on the relationship. Um, they are willing to sever people at all times and anytime. In Elon's case, it's a bit extreme, right? Um, and he does it not because it's useful to sever someone just like that. It's just to show an example that you know if you are dumb and stand in his way and stand in the team's way and the 
because it's it's a it's a team of high performers, right? And you're you're being counterproductive to this whole ecosystem. You're gonna get chopped out, you know. I think yeah. toxic leadership is a word that's thrown around, um, especially by low performers. Um meaning nowadays i think 80% of people that use this word is just people that were i mean not really but let me just finish that up before i i go to the the second i think um yeah it's just like oh this guy he he's like really an asshole and it, it's it's used a lot in the asshole context of like someone that is firing people at will but these leaders um ironically they seem to be building the largest companies in the world and the level you're probably referring to, which me, I'm referring to the founder and CEO level, because that's how I think. And that's who I interview is probably like someone in a corporation, you know, which I, I, yeah. I really despise that, that topic because I, I feel it's like full of politics and bureaucracy and it's full of these, well, it's not full, but there's these vile human beings sometimes that, are in leading positions and they they love it you know they just love to to be there that's probably the highest they'll ever go and every pent up years that they spent in a non leader position and eating shit now they they kind of uh, propagate that to lower stratas just like a uh, father that his dad beat him with a stick uh, is more likely to beat his children's with a stick for no reason just because that's what they were taught um now, now the question is, yes, in these corporations, some people may be stuck under this toxic leader that is really counterproductive, quite literally. So even if they perform, the leader will give them negative feedback and they're all about power. So me, my advice to these people is quite simple, like just leave and start a business, you know, uh, but it's more complicated than that because some people don't want to start businesses. So give me a, a bit more scope on the the uh, toxic leader phenomena and your potential solutions to it. So, uh, so I think when it comes to toxic leadership, you really have to think in terms of there are some who are intentionally toxic people, right? And, and let's be honest, like I would call that an evil person, right? It's a person who is intentionally power hungry, who intentionally abuses, manipulates, you know, um, uses their power to um, to put people down rather than to lift people up. But I've been working with leaders for for 25 years now, and what I've found is in in the time that I've been working with them, I've seen about five people who are intentionally toxic. They use and abuse their power. The overwhelming majority of people that I've seen were unintentionally toxic. And I shouldn't even say all leaders, like those who were toxic were unintentionally toxic. They weren't even aware that they were doing what their former bosses had done. They weren't aware that they were abusing power. And so as you shine a light on that and you begin to see, hey, if you're going to get great results, you, it's going to take a change of the way that you do things. It's going to take a change of the way that you build relationships I've seen the overwhelming majority of them make that switch and become really good, effective leaders because they realized the damage that they were unintentionally doing. Right. Okay. Well, corporations are not my favorite topic. I also think that they're going to drastically scale down with like the event of AI uh, in the next sure. few years. And I, I don't think most corporations are in a good position for that reason yes they do have huge amounts of treasuries that they will invest but scaling down on humans is really hard right because most humans in organization they actively work to plant their roots really deep and stay there and if if you try to unroot them you're unleashing a barrage of fire um so i that's why I, you know people are like oh monopolies and big corporations i don't think corporations are in a good position right now with the, what's happening with ai now i want to talk about the other uh, topic that i'm seeing here which is busyness um what do you have to say about i i call it bullshit work you know um or people that do and i consider myself to be doing a fair amount of that by the way and I, I consider most of the work that I do replaceable by an AI, while most people are not 
honest about that and would not would never say that an AI could replace what I do, but I think I'm, I'm really rational about it. So how can you make sure that you're not doing uh, BS work at the end of the day? Yeah, so I don't think there's really any any unknown magic formula to it. I think for most people, they do not live life by design. And or for most busy people, they do not live life by design. They default to saying yes when anybody asks them to to do something rather than defending their their yeses and making sure that they're they're saying only saying yes to the things that that really matter. My thing for a lot of people, they haven't really identified what what are the areas of my life that are most important to me and what are the goals and projects that are most important to me. That, and even if they do that, so a lot of our, the clients we work with, um, I'll, I'll tell you about one of our clients who uh, we were working on busyness and he had 15 priorities at one time. And I just, you know, real simple math. Hey, man, if you're concentrating on 15 different areas at one time, you can't possibly be doing any of them really well. And so it was forcing him to say these 12 things are not a priority right now. And that's where we really struggle at, as people. We struggle to say, yes, these other 12 areas, they're important. These 12 projects, they're important, but I'm going to have to put them on the back burner for now so that I can focus on the two or three that are most important to me. Priorities, right. And then I guess measuring the output of these and awareness is a strong one. So not only the business impact of it, but this podcast, you know, for example, helps me learn, helps me give back, um, helps me connect with amazing people, gets me a bunch of money as well. And yeah. I have fun doing it sort of a Nikki guy, you know, so uh, how how can you be it? a, a Nikki or a guy uh, is, is <laughs> the, the question and how can you develop activities that will have ripples um, throughout your life? So in your case, I see a speaker, I see the book here, I see uh, consulting and, and coaching. What are your areas of focus for these remaining two months of, of this year? Yeah, so uh, so most of our business is built around and is focused on, uh, like I said, going in, helping companies develop the leaders they need to succeed. So 83% of companies at all levels, 83% of companies say we need more leaders to succeed in the future. 5% of companies actually develop leaders intentionally. And so when we're going in, we're working with a company and we're focusing on developing seven traits. And they all start with the letter C, it's character, competence, capacity, clarity, community, culture, and consistency. Busyness is a capacity issue. Uh, by the way, but we focus on those uh, seven. And so uh, our company over the next two months, uh, one of the things we're really looking to do is scale uh, scale more to set up for the next three years. So focusing more on marketing, uh, focusing more on um, outsourcing or hiring some trainers um, who can take what we've already developed and then also go into other companies and do that. So that's our big, big focus for the next couple of months. Love it. And where can people find out more about you, Garland? Yeah, absolutely. So go to advanceleadership.live. That's advance, no D on the end. My name is Garland Vance. So advanceleadership.live or go to LinkedIn and I'm I'm there on LinkedIn as well. And that was another CEO Wisdom Podcast.com with uh, Charles Cormier as your host and Garland Vance.